This is Have You Met. Today we've got round two with Tom from our previous episode, in which we discussed his kidnap ordeal and nine months in captivity. If you haven't watched that, you should. The link is in the description. In this episode, we talk more about his true passion, the world of plants, flowers, and trees, along with his Lullingston Castle World Garden. Tom shares stories, facts, and anecdotes, all with his signature brand of passion and enthusiasm. Have you met Tom Hart Dyke? So, Tom, let's go back to our last conversation and recap uh, how you came up with the ideas and the plans for your world garden over there at Lullingston Castle. Um, yeah, take me back to how that, that came about. Well, Ben, I shall never forget June the 16th, 22 years ago, the year 2000, when me and a friend were kidnapped and three months into our captivity, I was searching for rare species of orchid on the Panamanian Colombian border. I mean, what was I doing? <laughs> it all seemed a good idea at the time. Don't don't get me wrong, fantastic orchids, but not the safest place to go. And me and a friend, yeah, we got kidnapped. And it was obviously, to start off with, especially very, very scary experience. But June the 16th was the worst day of my life. They'd built this palm house for me and Paul Winder, the guy I was with, a fellow Brit. It was about 15 foot long, eight feet wide and about 10 feet tall. And it was divided into two compartments, one for Paul and one for me. It was divided up by a palm leaved and banana barrier. And we were in, it was a dank area. It was in the middle of the tropical rainforest, quite mature rainforest. So it was very dark on the forest floor. And you're with inside this hut in the middle of nowhere and a very, very scary commandante in charge. He was a really nasty individual who really mm. wanted to kill us, torture us horribly beforehand, and then eventually blow our heads off. And he was an extraordinary character. Oh, he was absolutely, he was a nightmare. And <laughs> we called him Trapper because he literally trapped all the wildlife in these sort of, he had these um, shotgun cartridges with this, he hasn't got, hadn't got the gun, but he had the cartridges with this mechanism like a sort of like a mouse trap that hit the back of the cartridge and then sprayed out all the shot to whatever they were going to kill, whether it was wild boar and uh, guinea pigs and all sorts of things. And <sighs> during the 16th at five past 12, I'll never forget it. Into this palm hut came this guy who's only about 14 years of age. And we called him Scarface, top left to bottom right, had this amazing scar, almost cut his head into two pieces, Ben. And it was a machete wound, we found out. And he was proud of his machete wound. I mean, cheapers. It was quite well, well healed, but heavily scarred. It was a few years ago, he probably did it. And, oh, it, wow, life there is, is cheap, jeepers. I don't know how it happened, but anyway. And he said, you've got five hours, mate, before we blow your heads off, talking to me and Paul. And he smirked and walked off. He was so brimming with the enthusiasm of the idea of doing it, of murdering us. And it was like, oh, no, what are we going to do? Paul started praying next door. And as he turned his back, opened up my diary, it just fell open to the centre, two blank centre pages of my diary I've been keeping during captivity as a way of keeping me sane, really, and distracting myself from the really scary thoughts of what they were going to do to me, what they were going to do to, to me and Paul. I opened up my diary and it just came to me. Hard to sort of explain it. Just I just started scribbling what's turned into the world garden here at our family home at Lullingston Castle. It just happened. I started to phytogeographically plan the garden, phyto from the Greek plant, geography of where the plant comes from in the first place. So I had a miniature North America in its actual shape, South America, Africa, the Canary Islands as well thrown in, um, UK, Ireland, uh, Europe, Asia, Japan, Australia, and of course, including North and South Island, New Zealand in their miniature native land masses, roughly in their shapes, as you open your Oxford Atlas in a two acre walled area at Lullingston, I was to plant up plants from New Zealand in the right islands, North Island, South Island, more specifically than that, North, East, South and West parts of these islands. The centre of South Island would be a plant that would go there. So great for your geography to find out where all these places are and where the plants actually come from. I, I just lost myself. It was my own world that it turned into. It was total and utter botanical escapism. And we never saw the chap again. He never came back five hours later, obviously, to kill us. I'm talking to you today. And we never saw him again. 
And we still don't really know why, why these guys and ladies kidnapped us. And after nine months, as we have discussed before, they eventually released us. But I never thought I'd actually do the plan on actual terra firma. It was just mm. a way of me dealing with the, the situation. And when I came back to Lullingston, eventually after being released for Christmas of the year 2000, isn't Santa Claus great? Oh, Christmas. I love Christmas. <laughs> even more than I loved it before oh, because to come back at that time was absolutely awesome. And it wasn't until actually 2002, I started to draw the plans in the, of the garden, actually on terra firma in a design plan that we had to put it all to scale. It was a bit higgledy piggledy in my original diary plan. So we actually mm. went literally with spray paints and I cut a hole in a bag of sand to mark out where South America was going to go in what was quite at the time, an overgrown old herb garden, the two acre walled area. So, I mean, to me, uh, this is perhaps best at the end of our talk today, but saying it now, I think it's quite powerful. I mean, gardening and horticulture is such a therapeutic business industry, a passion hobby to be in. But in my case, every time I walk in that garden, after I've spoken to you this afternoon, I'll be going in the garden again. And when you walk in those garden gates, it's more than therapy because without that experience, the world garden wouldn't exist. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's crackers, a, Ben. It is it was crackers. <laughs> Absolutely crackers, the whole thing. And the yeah. more you think about that time, people do say to me, you know, what would you be doing, Tom, now? I mean, my only qualification, uh, uh, horticultural qualification, if you like, is I'm a, I'm arboriculturalist. I'm a, I was a tree surgeon. I studied that for two years at college and did three years of that as a job in our local area here. Uh, just self-employed on my own really uh, and saving up to, to go on this trip abroad too ending up to South, South America so it's just I believe that whatever you're into whether you've got qualifications for it or not if you're passionate enthusiastic about it you just do it right you just you just get on with it but I don't know what I'd be doing would it be something it'd be something plant related but I cannot answer the question Colombia completely and utterly changed my life mm. Yeah, I, I don't know where you'd begin to try and yeah answer the question, honestly, because it would be you said it'd be something plant related, but I'm sure you'd also need to have something kind of exploring and, and adventuring something like some kind of aspect like that. Otherwise, you'd get you just you'd get itchy feet. I think you'd want to go out and, and see see stuff like because that's a big part of what you did for a while, wasn't it? Um, it was like absolutely yeah yeah and since too i've done quite a few trips since as well a lot of which involves collecting if you're legally allowed to do it and the restrictions that are in place now and so on even mm. more so now but going back to 2009-10 when the garden had just started we can focus more on the garden i know as we, as we chat but the plant hunting still continues to this day in my mind and i managed to bring back quite a few plants to south america i did seven trips return trips not to the darren gap when the poor were held <laughs> hostage mum would not allow that i would never <laughs> go back uh, paul not so much paul was much more of an introvert he wouldn't mind, mind me saying and he keeps things to himself a lot more, whereas I'm, as you get a flavour for that, much more of an extrovert and, and share things a lot more. So perhaps for me, it's more of an event. Even talking to you now about the experience and so on is a, a bit of an event, perhaps, whereas Paul keeps it to himself. So he perhaps holds it back a little bit more than I would, and he does not want to go back to South America. But I loved it going back there. It was great therapy for me to do that, especially mm. my first trip in 2006 to Venezuela. I mean, I was shaking like a leaf at the airport when I arrived. Oh, the smell of just the food, obviously the lingo. I know I was in Colombia, but it's still Spanish. And for my not brilliant Spanish speaking abilities, it all sounded very similar. I mean, I was waiting for the captors to appear at Terminal 3 to kidnap me again mm. when I arrived in Caracas. It was really scary, but lots of plant collecting and some of the plants growing in the world garden and in the polytunnels that we've got. We've got some undercover areas for the more tender plants. Uh, I've got about four or five hundred things that I've collected uh, pre-Columbia, but mostly post. So wow. that side of it's been great. It's really urged me on. It's given me a, a mission in life to fill this two acre walled area and the environs to around where we live uh, with plants that I've collected all really starting off embryonically the whole project because of that scary day. 22 years ago yeah yeah it's, it's amazing an amazing story and yeah not a lot of people in that situation would have opened their their notepad and tried to start sketching you know think a garden a plant garden 
um that was so unique to you and and like do you remember your kind of thought process on that day was that from your point of view was that just entirely trying to shut off thoughts about the reality of what was being said to you and what was happening was that entirely you trying to yeah separate yourself from it or what do you think was going on was it a last opportunity to to kind of do what you love think about what you love Did, is any of those kind of hitting home or what would you yeah, think it the was the whole lot the whole lot is hit is hit, hitting home the thing is it was instant so it may have been in all of those things without me even so, thinking about it or processing yeah. subconsciously just started writing for all of those things that you've just said yes but without even thinking about those things i mean it was very you've got five hours you're gonna die who's very convincing this bloke mm. and it was the first time also ben as well it was three months into our captivity a quarter of a year and no one had really been that graphic about it it may have been a joke he may have got really fed up with us he you know we wanted to get rid of us or perhaps it was just a joke i don't know who cares but 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 it had the effect of yeah the effect it had it it changed my life and it was only what six months followed a half a year Mm. followed in captivity after that time really in captivity for 10 months right so and it wasn't there was actually a good timing in a way because we had a we did a lot of walking after that we walked for six weeks continuously at one stage right into Colombia right into the tropical lowland rainforest I mean it was fetid it was I mean your clothes almost literally dissolve in front of you whilst you're wearing them with the humidity everything is out to get you especially if you're a foreigner to those parts and so it really was a challenge and I would never have got to written I've barely opened the diary until coming back to to, to England the end of the year i barely looked at it again let alone added to it so it was a crucial time that in many sense yeah in every way really extraordinary yeah what like the rest of that day because obviously you get told that by this guy and you start your, your sketches your plans you're just in your in your your own little zone doing that but then I'm guessing as the hours passed and, and I'm assuming again that you didn't have a clock or whatever, but you, as you feel the hours pass and you feel the light change kind of, were you talking to, to Paul? What were you thinking at that? Did you start to kind of think I'm on borrowed time? It's going to be any minute now. They're going to come here and blow my head off. Or, and then after that, did you start to kind of gradually think, Oh, maybe it's not happening, but what was the th- whole thought process there? Cause that's just insanely hard to imagine dealing with, with that. It's weird. Isn't it? It's funny you saying all these things. Normally what you say, yes, you'd process it a bit like that or a, a derivative of that. But I just kept drawing. And I suppose you could say subconsciously you're thinking you're on borrowed, five hours is gone here. You're on borrowed time, as you as you rightly say. But it didn't really, those thoughts didn't really, in hindsight now mm. and, and during captivity to a degree after that time, yes, we were thinking, God, OK, um what 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 was their mission were they trying to get us to say something or perhaps it was just a joke paul was actually uh, as the hours passed he asked me what i was doing he couldn't see me we couldn't see each other they built mm. this palm barrier this is for six and a half weeks ben so it was it was incarceration really yeah. and particularly nasty set of people surrounded us and if the commandantes changed the personality of that commandante would fill the empty hollow vessels for personalities of the mm. foot soldiers the people lower down the rank and instantly it was absolutely poo your pants time i mean it the effect it had so if this guy was nasty which he was these guys turned the same people who we who were quite we got sort of not stockholm syndrome exactly but that kind of thing of trying to get them on board humanizing them making them in our heads not killers and murderers which some of them were and it, it was just it was so it was so strange the whole thing so so strange and I think at the end of the day, when the sun went down and it did, does in the jungle, 6 p.m. it's dark, 6 a.m. it's like it's almost 12 hours on, 12 hours off, quite mm. close to the equator here. Not really a seasonal change apart from it's a little drier than other times of the year, uh, a certain time of the year that we were there. And Paul was quite relaxed. He was Tom. He would have come back and shot us by now. I mean, it was three months in, but we were quite sort of, I don't know, they just didn't seemed too threatening after that and as days went on i kept writing but so it was only 
was only two weeks of being there. So I had a whole month of writing still. And I went crazy with the plans. And I needed all that time to distract myself from the situation. But actually, it became more than that. I was really enjoying myself. I was not only distracted, I was forgetting the seriousness of mm. our situation by these fanciful fantasies, botanical fantasies that I was writing in the diary. It was it, it was really strange. But yes, I think I didn't wait till five hours up. Like we hadn't got clocks or watches and they didn't really occasionally had a ca ca Casio stopwatch would appear on their wrists, but they didn't you just it got dark. It was dark. <laughs> it was mm. light. It was morning, you know. So but there was that sense, I think, at the end of the day, you know, phew, wipe your brow, okay. Um, they're not going to come to our morning and do it. He obviously was being a bit of a tit and had a bit of a temper turn or whatever, a bit of a tantrum perhaps. Mm. But yeah, I'm just that, that, I can feel him now, me talking to you about, I can feel him coming through that open door and just look on his face with that scar. I mean, it was like a cavernous scar. It healed properly, but it must have gone in so deep, the machete into the side of his head. He was like a watermelon cutting him almost in two. I mean, he was, um, what a character, Scarface. What a character. Yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah, I don't often talk about it, but it's funny talking about it. You really appreciate life, obviously, you might say. But, but you know, isn't life mad? You never know the avenues, the alleyways you go down, take a left or right turn, who you might meet. Yeah. It's, it's a funny old business, but I can't help but feel because people do say to and Paul, what idiots. And you're absolutely right. Should never have gone there in the first place. But you do feel not only were you meant to go there, that we were meant to get out of it. And I was meant to mm. do this garden. I mean, you could say, of course, you'd say say that, Tom. But I really do genuinely, ge genuinely believe this is my role in life, you know, to enthuse people about plants. And yeah, well, that's worked out OK. Yeah, I mean, it it does seem very like synchronistic, doesn't it? Everything that happened and and the fact that you weren't even supposed to necessarily be going down to South America because that was on the back of your Australia and and Tasmania trip and things like that. And then you stopped off in America. You were going to see a few, you know, the redwoods and stuff. And you thought, oh, I'll carry on down down south, have a look at a few more plants, and it just kind of snowballed, right? It just just happened. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And meeting this guy, Paul Winder, as you say, in Central America, and in particular, crossing the border from the States to Mexico, where I originally met, met Paul. I feel like I've known him since school. People, people assume that I do know him, mm. our college at least, or school. I met him literally for an hour and a half. We bonded instantly. I didn't know his surname until we were on our hands and knees with guns stuck to our heads. <laughs> That's always passport. I mean, I didn't know anything about him. So everyone's like, what do you mean you anything about him? But when you're backpacking, that's what happens. I mean, yeah. not quite being kidnapped all the time. I don't quite mean that. That's not what always ha happens. But but just bumping into people, you get a vibe. He'd be great to bump into him again, which I did almost faithfully. Uh, and off we went. So it's, it's a funny old business traveling. And I wouldn't take back what was over three years, including in captivity i wouldn't take back a second ben not yeah. a second yeah, you live like uh, live like it's... 10 lifetimes in those three years absolutely absolutely so tell me um like in the world garden have you got a section for colombia and panama like have you got a we... se or is it south america in general central america in general what's the yeah, so we've got we have got the Darien Gap, which is a pathway. We have made a Darien Gap deliberately, which uh, which actually accurately well, it's a border, isn't it, between North and South America? But it's a land bridge, so the only bit that disconnects it, you might say, is the Panama Canal, but that's man-made and that's further up anyway in Panama. But yeah, we have actually made a path in Tom's world, but I couldn't resist. And yeah. I do turn I do turn around to just check my back as I walk through the Darien Gap at Lullingston. It's gen generally safe. <laughs> Safer, though no one's going to jump out and shoot me i hope anyway but it's the only thing that central america itself has basically become mexico i have cheated terrible geography lesson here then so i have cheated a little bit because central america generally is too tropical for growing things outside 
mm. especially in the Cold Valley in northwest Kent. So what I do do is Mexico just takes over right the way from where Mexico is on the state's border, right the way through and it envelops into Panama, basically. And yeah. Colombia, yes, we have a Colombia, but very few things from Colombia outside because it's too tropical, really, Colombia to grow these plants in the UK. Mm. However, I've got lots of plants from Colombia in the polytunnels, so away from the garden. So the monkey puzzles from Chile, quite characteristic, quite prickly trees from mm. Chile. They've migrated from Chile to Colombia in Tom's world, <laughs> just wow. to fill up a certain. So we have moved, manipulated a certain areas. Uh, Central Africa is another area, the Congo and places like that. So yeah. Morocco, the Atlas Mountains of Morocco and Algeria have gone south into the Congo inexplicably but uh you, know, you have <laughs> cheated a little bit because otherwise you'd have bare areas ben or i suppose you might be able to have some bedding plants that you could have out so some of the tropical annuals and things that yeah. you could plant out for the summer but it would be bare for a lot of the year and for visitors coming early on it would look a bit rubbish perhaps so yeah yes there, there is a darren gap yes is the answer yeah wow that's yeah that's fascinating and and so yeah you've explained about the flowers and stuff so this i guess and you didn't bring any flowers back on the you know on christmas eve um on that trip um or did you did you have any kind of little bulbs in the in your backpack or something no well i was going to so i thought i was set, i should, should be clear all this time away three years people be thinking well three years so where did he send what, what did he do with all the plants well luckily i didn't keep them with me so plants from australia and southeast asia my trips beforehand which were grant funded which was fantastic weren't actually all in the rucksack otherwise it all be i would have lost everything in columbia because it would have rotted in the humidity mm. of the rainforest but i was sending everything home in these camera film kk all these camera film cases oh, yeah. which was brilliant and then storing them in the fridge at lullingston about two or three degrees above freezing or perhaps a bit higher and they'll last for many many years with those temperatures so so that so that was great but in columbia i did collect a few orchids yeah i did and that was really exciting. I collected a few orchids and I just trapped them to my rucksack. I the, the uh, ties on the back of the rucksack. I just attached the orchids with bits of air plants and using that as string, these sort of old man's beard, they call them air plants. That was brilliant fun. And we went, as we moved nomadically from camp to camp, I kept these orchids. But in the end, right towards the end, they got fed up with me carrying these orchids or they got suspicious or something and they ripped them off and they threw them on a bonfire and burnt them all. Oh. So cheers. I know it was so disheartening, but yeah. I was actually a league. I hadn't got a permit to, well, you're not, not supposed to even be there, let alone get a permit. So it, I was actually, if I'd come back to the UK with orchids during that trip, they would have been illegally collected actually, yeah. <laughs> but that wasn't the first thing on my mind when you're going to get executed really. I think priorities kick in life yeah, first, so. you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they burnt them was the answer. So no, not from that trip, but the trips beforehand and obviously since as well, I've managed to collect a few things and very exciting things. Some things growing in the garden here that grow nowhere else in the world outside where I collected them from. And wow. that is a particular yeah buzz for me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You'd have to tell me about some of those now. And um, before you do, I want to ask, say there's one that, that it's, yeah, can't grow anywhere else except the other side of the world, or say there's some that just just whatever what i'm asking you is plants that are not native to england is it possible for them to then pollinate if if you get kind of really hot weather um say you know 30 degree heat wave for a couple of weeks would it be possible plausible realistic or unlikely you know what what, what kind of odds are we looking at that they would yeah reseed and and start growing naturally Amazingly so. I mean, I'm absolutely astonished. So I, something I hadn't really anticipated, and it's all started off with three beehives that we got. Mm. And we've got about 98, 190, 100,000 bees. Actually, the wow. bee man's coming this week. God, it's being an apiarist is a right art. So much to it. It's a full time job. Yeah. And the bees have gone crazy with all the different plants in the garden and actually not being unpatriotic, but the bees generally prefer the non-native stuff, non-native stuff, sorry, the non-native plants. So the non-indigenous the stuff. Exotics. And uh, yeah, the exotics, <laughs> right. So you get more bees and, and, and other insects too that are pollinating things, albeit inadvertently in some cases. I mean, loving the salvias from Mexico, loving the echims from the canary islands and often not going towards some of the, na the native things and yes 
I'm amazed at how insects that are probably looking at these flowers and going, where, what <laughs> is that? I have never <laughs> seen that flower in my life. And go, oh, I can smell the nectar or I can see the pollen on that. Oh, that looks great. And so compatible. So we're getting so many seedlings appearing in the garden of species and hybrids because we've brought the world together Ben. Wow. so you haven't got the oceans you haven't got the mountain ranges the oceans in the world garden are pathways basically the pacific is a crushed granite pathway and the atlantic and and so on and the land masses do have li little ridges in them with rocks rocks from those actual areas around the world which is quite fun and yeah. the coastline we've used which are rocks for each of the areas are rocks that come from those various places but sourced in the uk but they are rocks that do actually occur in those areas and we have got little mountain ranges and so on and what amazes me is the compatibility for so many of these plants with our native insects i've never seen these flowers before and this is all new to them and the taste of the honey well that's another story incredible taste wow. absolutely a unique taste it's fabulous but yes to answer your question finally so much seed set we're getting so many things that are getting pollinated and you're getting true uh, species varieties of things coming up in the garden in kent that are originally from south africa or yeah. south america or australia but you're getting hybrids ben so you're getting uh, salvias for example and certain other plants lots of plants from the daisy family that albeit from different continents because you haven't got the topography the, the the oceans to stop these insects crossing in the real world it's amazing when you bring these plants together how they are so compatible when insects pollinate them you're getting so many interesting hybrids coming up it's really a byproduct of doing the garden that i did not expect to be so successful or didn't really think about actually mm, it's been wow. brilliant the bees have been absolutely brilliant that's amazing so the, the hybrids do they they'll like grow full size whatever and if, if if you have any that are particularly like beautiful or anything particularly different, does that get like classed as a new flower or anything like that? Or well, it's funny you should mention it. So two years ago, there's this amazing salvia that came up in the garden, and a salvia is a gorgeous plant from mostly from Mexico, from the states, the ones that we're growing. Slightly woody, they're sub shrubby, so they're not herbaceous, which means they don't get cut back right each year right to the ground and regrow. They're sub shrubby, so they have a sort of a woody mini tree framework and they only grow to about three or four perhaps five feet at the most high but they flower for nine up to nine months of the year whenever there's not a frost they will flower wow. and one came up in the path and it was different enough so di different in flats a lovely browny sort of burgundy maroony colored flower and we called it we named it after my dad who passed away you know quite recently and we named it dad's brown trousers <laughs> to explain it's not what you may be thinking it's because he loved his, his brown pinkish khaki trousers yeah that's wow. the explanation and we got yeah. officially recognized a year and a half ago in something called the rhs world culture society plant finder and if it's recognized in there you know it's top draw i've got to say and we awesome. now sell it at the nursery here nowhere else in the world can, can you buy one so that if that, i think that answers the question nicely and yeah. i was really dad dad would have been really passed away after it was found and it would be i think he'd be quite pleased with it the name probably not but <laughs> mum approved mum approved it was fine my aunt did not approve you can't <laughs> call it that people will think yes they may do but the reason is he actually had these lovely khaki brown pink trousers that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Um, so tell me about some more of your like favorites in the World Garden or some others that have kind of memorable stories attached to them or anything. Just tell me some interesting facts about your garden. I'm, I'm, I, I want to hear it all. I want to hear it all. I think I've got to start off with Australasia, Ben, and it's particularly dear to my horticultural heart i have to say and that's the eucalyptus collection we've got mm. the national collection of eucalypts and there's only two others in the uk and ireland and it's we've got about 56 57 different varieties of eucalyptus a handful that are undercover because they're not fully hardy in this country but a lot of them are the ones that i've actually collected and every time i walk past the miniature tasmania 
the mini Australia in the World Garden and the plantings exterior to the walled area. We've got a few acres of land as well on top of the walled area, which is brilliant. And they're planted out so they can get to their really full size, their full potential. Every time I walk past them and touch the lovely, smooth, peeling bark of eucalyptus, I think back to hitchhiking, backpacking in the middle of nowhere mm. in a World Heritage UNESCO site in southwestern Tasmania. You can touch the bark, you can touch the tree, and you can go back to the exact moment from January to April 1999, the four months that I was there, to that place. You can feel the cold, you can smell the moss around in the woodlands, you can smell the, the flora, you can see the lethal brown snake coming across in front of you. I mean, it really is magical and a real buzz for me to go abroad, collect plants in seed form, I should add. It's much easier to transport and legally there are less restrictions. Okay. Well, it's tricky, a bit, bit, bit tricky recently, but, but generally. And to come back, to, to take it back to Lullingston and to grow part of your expedition thousands of miles away on the other side of the world, here in southeast England to prove that modern day plant hunting still continues is so rewarding. And it's that buzz of going in eucalyptus in particular is the highest energy buzz of anything uh, horticultural that you can do in my life anyway, because you are going to areas that are cold. You're trying to get as close as you can to the climate re 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 relative to what you can find in Australia. To, to Kent. So you're trying to go to a really cold area in Tasmania, Southeast mm -hmm. Australia, target the ski resorts, inverted tree lines. So they can be quite low altitude, these inverted tree lines in a valley system. And the further you go down into the valley, even though the altitude can be quite low, the cold air sinks and it gets colder and colder and colder as you go down to the valley bottom, often with a river running through it. And the trees get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go down into the valley and yet the soil fertility is getting higher and higher and you're like mm. well, wait a minute normally in an area that's not as cold the trees get bigger and bigger and bigger as you get lower down to the rich fecund fertile valley bottom but in this case it doesn't they get smaller because it's getting colder and colder at this altitude and the trees just can't cope down at the bottom because it's just so cold those are the trees that you are collecting the seed of mm -hmm. and if it's got a lovely bark lovely buds flowers leaves you think oh those horticulturally endowed features horticulturally endowed what <laughs> earth am i on about anyway what i say sounds good horticulturally endowed features sounds very odd anyway <laughs> and are uh, just brilliant because you can go yes it's a fair bet the seed that you've collected will have those traits that's a better word, isn't it? More technical traits yeah. when you're growing it in Kent. And sure enough, they often do. Yeah. And you, are, I just love that. So it's got a better, my point is, it's got a better chance of surviving the UK climate if you really go out of your way to go to an area that's as cold as it, on, on the limit of what these plants can take in Australia with regards to cold and indeed exposure as well. Yeah. Because you've got one that's already halfway or three quarters adapted or, or a little bit more adapted already for the UK weather. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And there's an argument yeah. too. growing it from seed. It does. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So if you're growing it from seed from a plant that looks good, a very cold spot, its genes will be programmed. This is a general rule for plants. It doesn't always work like anything in life. But generally speaking, um, that will be the same look as what the parent is, maybe slight variant, but it will have the hardy genes in it. And you're growing it then from seed, from um, collection in this country, from seed to what, 40, 50 trees, 40, 50 foot trees they are now. And they are adapting to the climate that they're growing in on top of where you've got them from as well. So they're native areas, as cold as possible, and you're growing them here and they are adapting much better to our climate because you're growing them from seed. If you were to buy them in as big plants, they wouldn't be as adapted, even if they were from cold areas. So you've got two really good, chances of of them surviving the winter and the results have been fantastic always going to get exceptions a really cold spell and they might struggle but they've been look they look fantastic as i talk to you now they look brilliant you can see them out the window of the, the gatehouse oh nice um tell me i don't i might be wrong about this and it might be only applying to like one or two 
you know species of eucalyptus but are they flammable the eucalyptus trees are they are they flammable and they 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 want the fire they welcome the fire they encourage the fire and then they spit out their seeds in the fire to be the first to grow post fire is that is that real you've got it what an analysis yeah post fire <laughs> i like it absolutely yeah they do so they are called i mean they're called suicide trees and everyone's like what do, you, what do you mean they are designed evolutionary terms they are designed to set fire to themselves yeah. Not every single species of eucalyptus, but almost <laughs> all of them have full of these oils and are deliberately trying to set fire to themselves. And they've often got this gum bark that peels off, like sort of a snake skin that peels off these long tapering shoots. It's basically a wick for a candle. Yeah. Down to the ground it goes. Most forest fires are, are going along the ground. Most of them, sometimes they become airborne into the, into the crown, but mostly they're going along the ground. And they hit the bottom of this gum bark, which is also flammable. Every part of a eucalyptus is flammable. And it just goes right up the tree, burns the whole crown. And as you rightly say, the heat from the fire opens these, they're called gum nuts, these woody capsules, opens them up, but opens them up. Uh, and they slowly open up after three or four hours. And what's happened? The fire's gone through. Often rains have followed or the fire's cooled down. And what's the seed dropping off into? Lovely potash lovely ash when the rains come it germinates and it dominates the australian landscape as a result and often the parent tree will survive and regrow from these epicormic dormant buds that regrow from the side and so it's an evolutionary thing the heat is so much it kills it nukes all the competition around it nothing can survive except a eucalyptus it's very clever so you see these fires in australia and of course the, well, the increase of man increase of populations in australia and non-aboriginal management of the land now so you get this build up of dead matter over many many years that normally would have been burnt off mm. um by people by, by the indigenous people in australia and even yeah i mean it was done to a great degree they would deliberately have fires in controlled areas you don't get that as much now so when you do get a forest fire oh my goodness you see these houses going up and people running for their lives and but I mean, it's so much more accentuated now by mankind. And mm. there isn't that management program in Australia like there used to be. That's yeah. not really answering the question at all. That You want me to ramble? That is a ramble. But <laughs> it's, it, it's fantastic. And it's just amazing how eucalyptus are so adaptable yeah. um, to climate. Every part of the Australian continent is covered, you know, the landmass. It's yeah. absolutely amazing. From ski resorts plus 40 degrees i mean it's just amazing to see rainfall more than western england mm. or any part of france to rain that falls perhaps one once a year in an afternoon wow. they can grow in they're so so adaptable yeah that is amazing and then we can use their oils there for medicinal or for you know other purposes yeah, um, they definitely soothe the cold. I think they prevent colds. They don't prevent a cold as such. Mm. But when you've got a cold, when you, you usually use them, whatever it might be, say fixed vapor rub or yeah. um, lozenges of various sorts, and that's kind of thing. Yeah, and it's just to, they literally just subdue the symptoms. They break down um, um, the clogging of your nose and throat. They just have a soothing effect, mm. but they don't prevent, but they certainly get you through your cold hopefully a bit better off than without them do you use the ones at the the world garden do you do anything with them to use the the oils and stuff that they give you or not particularly i mean the one that's used worldwide is something called the blue gum eucalyptus globulus subspecies globulus mm. and the most it's amazing i didn't realize the country that produces almost all of the world's eucalyptus oil isn't australia <laughs> It's Portugal. Oh, Portugal really? produces almost all of the world's eucalyptus. And going through Portugal on oh, my push bike, as I did when I was a youngster from, from Kent to Portugal, was great fun. God, I had such a sore bum after three and a half weeks of doing that on my push bike. And going through the uh, huge eucalyptus farms, uh, grown purely for their wood as well, because it's quite quick growing, strong wood, but also for the production of eucalyptus oil was amazing. China's in second place about 29 percent or something and australia is like three percent of the world's eclipse all <laughs> comes from australia yeah. and at the, we, to answer the question yes we the, there's not they're not fully hardy those varieties so we haven't really you can't really pick many leaves off because they don't get to a big size here but occasionally if it's been quite a mild winter 
which so far, he says, it has, um, well, mild winter, spring, so far. And I could pick up a few leaves, get the bath really hot, mm. sink myself in the bath and drop lots of these eucalyptus leaves in. And you have the best bath, guaranteed wow. falling asleep material. I mean, <laughs> you are out and it really does soak up. Cleaning the bath afterwards is hilarious because it's so <laughs> sticky. All the oil, trying to get all the scum off the end of the, forget it. Oil just, it just sticks to your fingers, but it's a good experience. Wow. Yeah, it sounds it. And I'd like to say for the record, we don't encourage falling asleep in the bath. Uh, you do that at your own risk. Um... <laughs> yeah, I'm just, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so tell me, are there, tell me about some of the other plants you've got there that maybe provide more than just aesthetics. So like you mentioned, you use the eucalyptus to take a nice bath here and there. Which, uh, which other plants do you maybe use the leaves for or, or any part of the plant for, for a purpose? Yeah, you're right. But that's a, that's my biggest fault, really. My ethnobotanical mm. knowledge and skills are quite good, but we don't really put it into practice. We, we have a few edibles here, lots of herbs. I mean, it really, the ethnobotanical angle is a byproduct of what I'm doing. My main aim is, isn't that plant pretty? Uh, for whatever reason, the flower, the leaves, the stem, or the bark. Ornamental is my main interest. However, the amount, we've got some 8,000 different types, different varieties of plant in the world garden here. And it's a great reflection of the plants from around the world, except perhaps the tropical elements, not well represented because of the climate. Mm -hmm. But as a byproduct of that, often I'm planting things and realising, well, it's got a smelly leaf. You look, look it up and, oh, yeah, that'll go on the roast beef for a Sunday lunch. That would be brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, the obvious things are lavenders and rosaries, sprigs of that. Um, they're, they're great for your immune system and often things that so perhaps if you get stung or if you get cuts, I mean, the classic is aloe vera, but any aloe from South Africa, we often use. It's amazing the effect. If you've got a deep cut, often caused when you're pruning an aloe because they're quite <laughs> sharp. So you cut yourself or you scratch yourself with an aloe, then you cut a leaf off and use the aloe juice. Revenge. Yellow. Yeah, that's right. And when it dries, you, you, it really tightens the skin as it dries. And it goes quite crystalline, but yeah, it's amazing. And even on quite well, well established scars, I'm looking down here at my hand. I've got lots of cactus wounds <laughs> Ooh, un un under the nail is the worst ever point to get a cactus spine. Oh, it's like I a splinter imagine. from a floorboard. Oh, it goes in. It's a form and of torture. You pull it, it's a form of torture. Yeah. <laughs> and it's brilliant. Fun. I love it. But you often scar. But with aloe vera, even quite well established scar, the scar doesn't disappear exactly, but it really becomes far less present, far less accentuated. So the aloe vera we do use if you do cut yourself. And one, one plant that there is no cure for that we've got is the world's most dangerous plant. And it is not illegal. I'm just smiling. It's not illegal <laughs> to have it, but for health and safety, which we haven't got at Maddington, no health safety bill whatsoever <laughs> and there, there really isn't and people love it because of it and at Q they can't believe Q Gardens came to pay a visit last year and they saw this deadly stinger it looks a bit like a stinger nettle it's a sort of shrubby plant from Queensland where I collected it and so it's not illegal to collect but for health and safety no garden in the UK and probably Europe has got one except here and <laughs> Q Gardens are like oh that thing's like that's a Great plastic imitation he got going on there, Tom. Um, well, actually, it's real. Tom, it's real. I said, I've just told you it's real. I can't believe you're growing it. If someone falls into that, it's nine months of the most intense burning pain. And I've been had the experience of that, a hole in my glove, basically, just on my upper part of the finger here. Quite a tough part of the finger. If it was a softer part to the body, it'd be even worse. And the, the sting goes in, like a stinging nettle. And it's like, basically hypodermic needles going in the needle breaks off the end releases this concoction of acids and it's like a stinging nettle the pain to start with but a, then it goes on to about a hundred times the strength of a stinging nettle and lasts for nearly a year and people sometimes often cut them have to cut out they get then their mind starts going and they start cutting out some of their skin to get rid of the pain which of course doesn't work it makes it worse because you're physically cutting yourself out mm. it's um you might think tom what are you doing we've got it in a cage it's all nicely labeled inside kids love it <laughs> and it's fantastic with mayonnaise in a salad ben you can eat it really 
No, you can't. Oh, Kelly. you got me. It Damn it. Kelly. <laughs> so I just, I just, oh, I just love things like that. So that's not an ethnobotanical use for a plant at all. That's a dangerous use for it. And obviously, yeah. not recommending it, re- re- recommending it, any of this. But it's my childish, as you can tell, my childish nature. And it's just showing people plants that they simply can't see anywhere else yeah. except going to the place to, to, to find them. And that's not practical for some people to go to Northeast Australia, yeah. let alone find the plants in the middle of nowhere. So you're bringing that to, to, to Kent. You're bringing Australia to Kent. And I love that. That's great. Yeah. But yeah, lot, lots of different plants to answer the question. Yes, there's lots of different plants. The salvias, the sages are brilliant in suits. Tell me just briefly, before I let you keep going, just one second. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, just yeah, yeah. about the, uh, the, the pain. Uh, your experience of that because because you said it could be like really painful for a year how was it for you specifically it, it, was, it wasn't too bad as, uh, what i should say as i mentioned a minute ago part of the finger it was on yeah. this bit of the finger is quite a tough bit of the finger or well, anything on the fingers pretty tough when you get starting around the the, the the wrist let alone anywhere on your legs apart from perhaps your shin bone oh it'd be a nice face would be a nightmare and it, it to me it was you couldn't sleep for about two or three weeks um, literally could hardly sleep and it's strobbing it's bang 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 mm. and i stay a hundred times the strength of a stinging nettle but it doesn't dull ben and it wants you to itch it it's making of course you ne- 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 inevitably do is it an and itchy it just, pain yeah, it, yeah but it's like a rash itch but yeah. much worse than that oh. it's hard to i'm not over egging it you can't underestimate yeah. it it's just <laughs> so bad and what it responds to and makes it worse is cold or change in temperature. So if you get into a hot bath or cold bath from a warm house to outside, it becomes worse. So it was snowing when this happened. And of course your hand feels like it's on fire. So what did Thomas do? Put his hand in the snow. And I, literally when my hand came out, it can cause paralysis, temporary oh, paralysis. Wow. So yeah. I couldn't drive for about a week or so. I mean, it was just the most awesome. I mean, awe of the plant. I mean, the yeah. pain was bad and everything. And it can cause into some people suicidal tendencies. It's a brilliant thing. That's an insane plant. So what's the name of this plant again? Uh, the, the Queensland Stinger. The Queensland or Gimpy Stinger. Gimpy. G- Gimpy Gimpy is the Aboriginal name, which literally means badass, which I love. <laughs> and it's great. And it's called Dendrocanide moroides is the wow. is the real name but i'm not doing anything illegal but it's quite close <laughs> to but gotta be done gotta yeah, be done ben. yeah yeah i mean it's, I'm, I'm it's in a cage so i'm i'm i think there's no problem there. it's in You're a cage good. it's not near the path that close to the path if a kid fell in it <laughs> uh, he should be all right and if not he'll have stories for the you know to tell everybody for the rest of his life so there you yeah go. exactly <laughs> um so carry on before i interrupted you i don't know if you remember where you were i think you were just going to tell me about some plants you can cook with the medicinal plant that's right so it's very much things that i sort of anything from the salvia family mm-hmm. salvia which is the lamiaceae so the salvia that includes rosemary uh, that includes lavenders and this well they're well known for being fantastic great, great for your immune system great mm. for things against eczema in particular you haven't necessarily got to to to, to um to rub, to rub it on or make a um a, a, a soap cotton wool in, in, in lavender oil and things like that you can actually consume it and it will have mm. a great effect for alertness as well and keeping the mind flowing and it, it, it really works actually so yes it's basic stuff but i do not pretend um to have any apothecary sort of background and I, that is something that disappoints me in myself it, because that most people come to the garden that to, to them if they're not almost always into the ornamental but they appreciate plants to them it's what uses humans can get from a plant you know that really completes the horticultural picture for them whereas for me it tends to be the ornamental side However, it's an area that we're really going to get into. And Ooh. plants that, well, the funny thing is that people can't believe, especially some of the scientists, you often get a scientist. There was a Polish chap last year was like, said, Tom, I don't know what these plants are. He was particularly into his ethnobotanical stuff. Is Tom, this could be a cure for this. You may have mm. introduced something that has a cure for bowel cancer or, or whatever it might be. And he's got a point. He couldn't believe that I was growing it yeah. just for ornamental reasons. So there could be cures for all sorts of things we don't know about. And we're sitting on this collection. But yeah. that could be for many for many gardens the same, I'm sure. Yeah. But, it, I mean, it is amazing how many plants, yeah, can be used for, for different things and can benefit us in one way or another. I mean, 
there's probably thousands right or or more tens of thousands potentially i don't i, I don't know but everything yeah you the ones you've mentioned you also got things like chamomile and obviously the the, the controversial cannabis marijuana um which i don't know if you're very familiar with growing but yeah the magic mushrooms i suppose as well mushrooms are different types the the tasty ones and the ones that now potentially they're saying can offer you know help for people going through mental illness or depression and things like that um do you know anything about those i, I suppose not so much. Uh, no i i don't grow up people always assume tom where's your cannabis because you're clearly on it i'm like no i'm not i've never tried it magic <laughs> mushrooms and things like that it's hidden people in the world garden somewhere <laughs> exactly a top secret place that's a special greenhouse safe for them yeah no we haven't got any we've never really experimented with with cannabis i mean the non the non top toxic stuff um mm. grow, grown for yeah horse bedding and that kind of thing and and so on and but it's just quite an ornamental plant it is an annual so it would be a bit of work to regrow and start again yeah. and you wouldn't need a license for for some of it but we haven't actually grown a lot of it i've got plants that often have cat cannabine in the name but no i've never tried cannabis although you might think i have <laughs> and it's it's there's plants that look like cannabis as well yeah. that have a lovely that actually from a distance you really think oh is it cannabis that are herbaceous plants this one called datisca cannabina leaves like cannabis and it's got the form of the flower head slightly drooping at the top sacking the same height too 12 13 feet high it can grow to wow which cannabis can as well some of the biggest strains so it does look people do comment on that and go oh that's right you know what's that sort of thing but no we don't actually grow cannabis or or things like that and also, yeah, it is the space for it because they're annuals. You don't want to grow one, one or two. We want to grow quite a big clump and, and that kind of thing. So mm. they don't tend to do as well. Well, when you um, said um, space. you said then something like uh, that they 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 look like uh, other, you know, they, they you have plants that can look like cannabis. You made me think of plants that can look like and you made me think of orchids, like because they mimicry, you know, like they, they can do things that they can look like other plants. Like there's one that looks like a bee, right? A female yeah. bee. Yeah, and, to trick, um, trick, trick pollinators and yeah, oh, it's very clever. Yeah, and there's there's what like twenty five thousand? Am I right there? Twenty five thousand plus? At least, yeah. at least, yeah, yeah. Species of orchid, which is just insane, and and they're all unique. They're all different. They all either look something amazing or have some feature. They're your favorite plant. I'm not mistaken. And in... oh, I do love them. And they're now the world's largest family of flowering plants, the orchids, and they beat the daisies now, which is brilliant to know. And they're. <laughs> they're finding like two or three hundred species a year so you talk about things that plants that could be medicinal to save humans or, or whatever it might be a condition they haven't yet to be discovered you're absolutely mm. right because they're going to the tropical rainforests of new guinea in particular and parts of central africa east africa mozambique's a former war-torn country so not much access you know so heavily mined over the years mm -hmm. from the conflict there back in the day so they're now accessing areas for the first time um, because of also the inaccessibility of places and orchids are often they're, they're to be found on every continent the orchid family except antarctica and they are absolutely awesome they're absolutely but and it's their adaptability to various conditions it's the mimicry as you say with orchids that are, are fascinating mimicking a, a, a bee such as our native bee orchid fly orchid um, spider orchid uh, frog orchid uh, that's more it looks like a frog rather than it's trying to attract a frog to pollinate it mm. but it's just that the pure trickery and pure grotesque look and smell of a lot of these orchids and their trickery in pollination they often have these chambers that are one way with hairs that point one way so when the insect goes in is it going to change its mind well it can't go back <laughs> it has to go forward into these series of chambers in, all, in order to attach the pollina, the pollen sacs, which are quite sticky onto the back of its head, thus ensuring pollination. Very clever. Force the insect to pollinate it. There's one in Australia called the hammer orchid, and it literally, the insect lands on this platform, whacks it onto the pollina quite aggressively, wow. flicks it, literally hammer blows it onto the, the pollina, and then it sticks to the insect and off it goes. Very clever. So a real mechanism to, to wallop the insect, to hit it, body onto the pollen it's very clever these orchids i that's love amazing. them i love them yeah that's halfway to a carnivorous plant there with the the whack and the, uh, <laughs> it, the is, fly, it is which are amazing as well but i mean yeah orchids it just seems unbelievable are, are they all really different to grow are they like really you know completely varying or are there some overlap because 
I think they, you know, they all look so different, even though they have features in common, which again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the feature in common, maybe there's other plants that have this too, but they're symmetrical, like only one way when you draw a line down them uh, horizontally, they're symmetrical, uh, whereas most flowers are kind of have more lines of symmetry. That's um, it. That's it. Exactly. So you can cut them in two and they really are pretty much perfectly the same with the three sepals and petals, the arrangement that they've got. And the labellum is also a part of that too, mm-hmm. with a lovely lip that comes out often. That's often the landing platform for the insect. It's yeah. like a sort of ha- hairy runway, the runway that the insect go, goes up. But it's very clever. But to answer your question, yes, there is overlap. I think mo- mo- most of which pe- people don't realise grow in trees, something called epiphytes. So they grow epiphytically and they're simply, I mean, they're hardly growing in any humus for really any soil of any, any substrate of any sort. They're simply using their host, uh, which is like a tree, a shrub or vine as anchorage. And I say host, they're not parasitic. No orchids have been proven to be parasitic. They're simply using their host as anchorage for excellent air movement high up in the canopy. Often it's too dark on top of the can, uh, too light on top of the canopy. The orchids will burn too dark below. So they're often halfway house in the tropics or mm. uh, whatever. If, if it's a shrubby sort of mini rainforest shrubland or whether it's tall trees, they'll often be not the top or the bottom. And you get this amazing layer of orchids, the ones that prefer the shade lower down to ones that tolerate more light bathing and just clothing the, the tree i mean they look absolutely amazing you can sometimes only see orchids you can't even see the tree they're on really? there's so many of these almost communities that orchids form wow. with bromeliads um air plants and often with cacti too strangely a lot of cacti grow in trees which people, people don't realize especially mm. in the tropics and and also ferns you get that combination so in the, in the greenhouses here we've just got one orchid house it's one structure it's not divided up but it's cool so the minimum is about 10 degrees 50 fahrenheit and that will cover most tropical orchids around the world most but the really warm ones from the warm warm tropical areas of borneo new guinea congo uh, northeastern australia queensland lots of tro- tropical areas there, lots of orchids. They need a minimum of about 15 to 18, heading up towards a uh, room temperature as the minimum. And we can't provide that here because we haven't got the right heating, really, enough yeah. heating. And also the structure itself do- doesn't allow for that. But yeah, c- cool will cover most of them. When, when you go below cool, when you get to freezing point, most of the orchids then become terrestrial, if you like. So when you get to cooler temperatures, a temperate area, the temperate parts of the world, such, such, such as we're both in, you'll get the orchids not being in trees. They will be in the ground as terrestrials and they're much hardier for outside. Mm-hmm. And yes, you can grow quite a few of our native orchids. Can be tricky. They can be tricky. We've got an orchid meadow here. Actually, after this chat, I'm going to, as well as being in the garden, I'm going to go and transfer a few pyramid orchids that have naturally come into to the garden. Lovely mm-hmm. pink pyramid shaped flowers making up about a spike about nine, ten inches tall. Lovely pyramid head of flowers, almost perfectly pyramidal when it starts to come out. Gorgeous pale pink fading to, uh, sorry, um, glowing to a sort of dark pinky colour before they turn brown in July. Gorgeous native. And they're coming up in the lawn, but they're in the wrong place because the <laughs> lawnmower man's coming tomorrow and they're going to be mown over. So oh, we're no. going to move, move, move them to the bit that they're supposed to be growing in. But orchids, yeah, that variety is, is, is exceptional. Well, they are the largest family of flying plants in yeah. the world now. Tell me about some of like the most interesting orchids, the most interesting individual species, or just some cool facts about orchids in general, if any pop to mind. Yeah, the one that really pops to mind, and people don't realise, vanilla is an orchid. Mm. The, the, the vanilla orchid. People don't realise that vanilla is actually comes from an orchid, not just any old orchid, mostly from Madagascar, which produces almost all of the world's vanilla. And it's the world's longest orchid. It's a climber. It grows to up to 100 feet long, this climber. And it shatters the illusion of an orchid. And people think it's some sort of vine and it can grow up and amongst trees. I've seen it growing in Madagascar where me and mum visited Madagascar 
on my last sort of trip abroad, really, uh, January 2020. That was amazing, seeing the baobabs and things like that. It was fantastic in Western Madagascar. And, yeah, about the size, size of France, Madagascar. And it yeah. was incredible seeing these. Oh, I thought they were just vines. Well, I suppose they're acting as a vine. These amazing vanilla orchids. And it's vanilla pods that are harvested to produce the flavour that we're so familiar with. What I love when you get your ice cream packet, vanilla, vanilla on it. You've occasionally got the pods, which are usually quite accurately um, interpreted, um, but they often had the flower on it. And it's often just a normal orchid house plant that they've got <laughs> depicted on there because people can relate to that more as an orchid. But it's not a vanilla orchid at all on there. Oh, they've yeah. often got a different uh, because people are familiar or perhaps they generally made a mistake. I, I don't <laughs> know, but... <laughs> Could be but orchids are great, and some of the Turkish terrestrial orchids, because the word orchis comes from the Greek orchis, which means testicle, and a lot, mm. a lot of the terrestrial orchids have these two bulbs with hairs on them, and the ones in Turkey are used as an aphrodisiac. Oh, really? It's called um, salep, salep, S A L E E P. I think they use it in Greece and Turkey a lot for an aphrodisiac. Apparently. Wow, I mean, I've never tried. I who can't knew? comment. Yeah, there should, there should be some body out there testing every single plant, right? Like tr- <laughs> eating it in different ways, maybe smoking it, maybe, you know, cooking it, maybe uh, all sorts of different things and just t- they're testing they're probably, they're probably how it affects then. people. Yeah, yeah probably you're, is, you're right. Right. probably is, but they probably all died <laughs> <laughs> because they've, oh no, that's poisonous. Oh, well, and it's amazing. The apothecaries of years gone by. I mean, the monks, people don't talk about how many monks died or nearly really? poisoned themselves because they were the, they were the first line, line, line of this. They were the ones experimenting with all of this and the, based on the results of what they found, whether they died or not. I mean, that was, that's been used to this day. So wow. yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, you've got to get the right plant. Yeah, consume the right <laughs> thing. So go back to the world garden and tell me about yep. another another favorite or another highlight or something. You know that if if you had the queen come and visit, that's the place you're going to take make a beeline straight for this plant. Um, yeah, tell tell me about some some of your favorites. You look no further than Puya Ramondii, P U Y A Ramondii. It's the queen of the Andes, Ben. You're like, what's he on? I'm just on tap water this afternoon. That's all it is. <laughs> but it's so exciting. It's and a big I collected... plant, I think, from from my immense yeah. knowledge of, of plants. <laughs> it is. It's a bromeliad, uh, which is those air plants that you get. And pineapple is a relation. What oh, we, really? the pi- pi- pineapple is a bromeliad. But this is um, a not, a, a, not like a, a, a pineapple. I collected it from about 10,000 feet above sea level, just over 3,000 metres. Not that high in the Andes, actually, compared to what it can get to, over 5,000 plus metres. But this was on the border with Bolivia and Peru in 2009, stroke 2010, two expeditions I made to the region and collected this plant. And it's monocarpic, which means it dies one flower. It dies after flower. So often with these mon- monocarpic species of plant, they produce this huge flower spike. And this does that. Wow, d- does it do that? I saw 23 of these in flower at once. The highest I measured was 44 foot flower spike. It's the biggest inflorescence flower spike on our planet. And that is the biggest ever recorded, the one that I spotted, 44 oh, wow. foot of it. And it, 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 was, it was endowed with hundreds of thousands of flowers hundreds of thousands of flowers it's amazing sort of columnar structure that comes out it's quite a spiky leaf base and they can take up to 80 to 150 years to flower so you get quite a big sort of clump of very spiky leaves that can take up to us over a century to produce get enough to maturity to produce this spike and the spike itself is only six to seven months of growth bang out it comes out of the center and after the the, um, flowers fade hummingbird pollinated which is an amazing experience to hear and see all these hummingbirds around you. Amazing experience. And beetles as well that pollinate it and moths mm. and things. Um, the whole thing dies and it dies, falls out of the ground, uh, uh, falls, this just falls out of the ground and falls onto the, the, the floor and hundreds of thousands of seeds that have been produced, if not millions of seeds, then get scattered all around for um, for pollination so pollination is very poor uh, with a lot of the seeds so i think that's why it has to produce so much in order to have at least two or three successes or yeah. more but it's an amazing experience seeing 23 in flower at the same time it was a a, a lottery t- ticket it really was a complete 
lottery as to whether you're going to see them in flat. And I felt like I'd won the biggest ever prize on the lottery ticket when I saw them. It was absolutely amazing experience. At that altitude, running around is not a good idea, Thomas, with excitement. I, ne- I nearly died. It was just, look at this flower. Oh, my heart rate's gone up too much because the altitude just ridiculous and the, the lack of oxygen. But, yeah, very exciting. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's awesome. So is it still, how big is it in the World Garden, the one you brought back, the one you've got there? It's doing reasonably well. It's actually undercover. I, I have got it undercover only because um, it's not fully hardy. And it's about three foot by two foot from seed. What we're looking go over 10 years ago. It's quite slow. Lots mm. of silvery spiky leaves. So when it flowers in what, a hundred years time, you've got to come and see it then. You've yeah. got to come and see it. <laughs> 110 <miss> years. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, what is, does it grow like faster than the monkey puzzle tree? Are they, are they really slow? Cause I remember that from a kid, I remember being fascinated with those trees and I, and I think I heard they were really slow to grow, but they can me. be. They can be. They're, they're from South America as well, the monkey, pu- mm. the monkey puzzle. They can be quite slow, but I have to say, when they get going, I mean, they're putting on at least two feet a year here. Oh, now, really? that's two foot from every growing point, as well as the main central one. So it, it does have quite an impact. So our ones, what are they, 18, 19 feet tall from a plant that was put in in 2007 at about four foot tall. So oh, wow. 16, 16 odd feet in uh 15 years yeah and there's not brilliant soil here so i think with say an acid soil which we're not on i think an acid soil they, they, they would grow faster than that how fast is like the, the the fastest growing like how are there any trees that get up or plants that get up to yeah 20 feet plus or you know five ten meters plus that can do that in in a really short space of time yeah, eucalyptus are, are, are yeah. pretty much the, quick, the quickest growing trees. There might be a couple of tropical ones, but eucalyptus are well known. I mean, from seed to harvesting trees 40, 50 feet in five, six years in the tropics. Wow. Five, six years. So they're going 50 feet in, in, in five, six years. They're really quick. The quickest growing plant in the world, staying corrected if I got this wrong, I think this is right. They measure it in kilometers an hour. Nought point and then six noughts, six kilometers an hour. Nought point, six noughts, six kilometers an hour is, is bamboo. And it can grow about a meter a day, something like that. Uh, and there's ones you see in the tropics of Indonesia, these massive, I mean, they can, can't get your hands around the base of these stems. And they're all 30, 40 feet tall. And the guide saying, yeah, that started in January and we're now due. And you're like, oh my God. I mean, so, you re- literally watch them A meter grow. a day, they can actually grow They a can grow a, a, a meter a day. Some of the, that's more the tropical varieties. And they, re- even the shoots here, Ben, so you can get them to grow about 15, 16 feet in about two months something wow. like that so they're pretty quick but yeah a meter unreal. a day that 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 is insane yeah yeah so you could literally like you said sit and and watch it for the day watch it grow that's uh yeah. wild <laughs> yeah it's crazy and some of the climbers are quite well even a, a common bramble at uh, so many of the climbers especially they've got tendrils that pull onto things to pull them up towards the light and try and get past some of the competition they're surrounded by they tend to be quite quick too they need yeah. to be quite quick to yeah get ahead of the competition but yeah eucalyptus they can I and mean, the ones here that they grow six six feet a year is possible with some of them unless they get quite mature then they tend to slow down a little bit mm. but yeah makes sense um are there any other like highlights or special trees plants flowers in your world garden that you want to touch on before we maybe kind of move on and i kind of do a little bit of a sort of quick fire-esque questions with you um i don't want to keep you too long so and i've got a few things i'd be interested to hear your take on so are there any others that you want to dive into and tell me about tell us about before yeah absolutely ben there's one one thing in particular i'm very keen and that was a type of a snapdragon it's actually called a penstemon i mentioned the name after my granny who was my great influence mm. in the plant world as we mentioned yeah. last time and at the age of three she gave me a packet of car- carrots and a trowel and i've never looked back you know a packet of carrot seeds and a trowel she was amazing and i've never looked back and she was just self-taught like i am and in green blood cells at a young age instead of red and off we went you know she was amazing and we managed to find a new type of variety of this pencil and it's a lovely it's like a snapdragon except it's got a purple flower the lovely they call them the beard's tongue in the state which is a great name and in mexico as well they've got this lovely furry throat uh, with this little tongue going down the centre. It's an absolutely gorgeous flower. And that I found the day I met Paul Winder in November 
1999 i was drying the seed on a corrugated metal roof and oh. this, it, it's quite difficult to grow but it's a great plant we presented it to granny uh, it was a fantastic plant to name after her it was absolutely brilliant so it's those personal touches i think my dad salvia mentioned earlier that was mm. found in the garden actually um, but something the only thing i've managed to actually bring back and name after somebody was that plant and it had to be granny she was my great influence in the plant world and yeah an amazing person yeah wow that plant um can have you got a few now like is it have you got more multiple of them yeah the problem is ben try not to get caught out and lo losing them and for, and then having no spares yeah, so there's yeah, two yeah. friends two friends one who's a really good person at propagating various things from cuttings and seeds and so on she supplies the plants with the uh, for the nursery actually here and she has some spares because i do not trust myself with just a couple of plants that are in the garden in the miniature mexican section that we've got them in so we do we make sure we've got spares because if you lose that that's it yeah it, it can't be found anywhere else so it's uh, very unusual because the, the, it was from seed so the plants that i collected it from and not the same as what's germinated. There's been a bit of pollination, perhaps, or just a bit of natural selection. That the flowers are slightly different from what I collected, so it's unique and very exciting. Yeah, so we're looking yeah. after it. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Um, any any others? Because I know you love your garden so much. So are there any others? I, I don't want to cut you off if you've still got some that you you need to tell me about or that you need to vocalise. Um, I, I think personally, the personal ones to me always mean the most, especially if I've collected them and, and so on. And eucalyptus, I've mentioned, I mean, there's yeah. 40 or 50 of them I've collected, but I've just gone for the collective, a eucalyptus. Yeah. Plants that have inspired me at a young age, growing up here at Lullingston, are three magnificent cedar trees, cedar of Lebanon, Cedrus libanii, and they're growing between the house and the church. And they were all planted by relations, all pre-Victorian. The oldest is about 1785. It's got a fantastic wow. bowl. They call it B-O-L-E or lower trunk, basically. Fantastic trunk. Five, six people holding hands in a daisy chain. Can you just about get around these plants? And then it's 1803 and about 1820 for the other two. And seeing, seeing them right now, as I talk to you, with the lovely silvery foliage they develop at this time of the year is, is magnificent. Great boughs they produce, great arms of branches. They've inspired me since I was born. Uh, they are magnificent trees to look at. And probably the one that was collected in 1785, uh, this was around when Kew Gardens was being founded. 1770s mm -hmm. was Kew Gardens. So it was from an expedition, probably, maybe, we think, that relations did actually mount to the Middle East, to Lebanon, and Syria, where they originally come from. So it'd be nice to think that there is a plant hunting link in the family, which otherwise mm. there isn't really. So yeah, seed of Lebanon, I'll finish on that as my favourite because I see it every day. and Every day I go past it, I am absolutely awe-inspired. Yeah, it must be amazing to know that it was planted, yeah, by somebody in your family, like almost 250 years ago, coming up to that, coming it's up crackers. to a quarter of a millennium ago. It's great, isn't it? And, and it's living, it's alive. It's not something that was there or something that's dead or something. It's actually still going. I have to say it's past its prime, admittedly, but it's still looking quite good. And as you say, that plant hunting connection and yeah, it really is. That's why I've got my tap root on the front lawn at Lullingston going into the ground. I'll always be here. And for reasons like that, it's just it's just brilliant. Do you ever sit sit by it or sit on it or stand on it, lean on it and kind of just try to imagine like what it's you know what it's seen and and the life it's had um, i was not climbing it yesterday <laughs> oh really yeah it's great i'm 40 <laughs> nearly 46 so, i mean what am i doing it's a great Are you a good tree climb. climber reasonably okay not as I good as you, i was you, you you must be i think i mean i've seen a few clips of you climbing trees out in who knows where in the world I'm a bit of a tree climber myself as well. That's something. It's great if, fun. I, if I ever come down to Lullingston, then you'll have to show me some trees. We can have a little absolutely, bit of a, absolutely. a competition. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, so tell me, plants in general, again, it might just be that there's a couple of specific ones that could do this, but in terms of communication, that some plants can communicate with other species of plant or with their own species of plant or with, I don't know, is, does it go further than that? But do you have any thoughts or knowledge on, yeah, plants communicating? A lot of it's new to me. It's in great books out now. In fact, I've got one, one of the books here and stuff with the, the, the symbiotic relationship the tree roots have with various fungi. 
And it, it's amazing how uh, I, I, just this network, I mean, it's amazing. It's so obvious that all the roots that, you know, what you can't see, you forget about, you mm. don't know. You see the tree's trunk coming out of the ground. Oh, isn't that tree amazing? The real, real connectivity, the real energy, the real excitement is what you don't see. The yeah. plethora of tree roots. And yes, some species, I think they've got to be, from what I can gather, say a beech woodland or an ash woodland, referring to the UK woodlands, have to be generally of a similar species, generally, to be able to really get that connection going. And if a disease is coming in, whether it's um, aphids that are eating it, perhaps a fungal disease, they communicate with each other to warn them of an attack that might be coming. Or if someone is being, uh, if, if uh, I'm talking like a human, isn't it? if a tree is being actually attacked by an aphid or so, to give them advance notice. And that will often stimulate uh, chemicals within the plant to get to the leaf that will put off the insect as a deterrent for eating them. And they are, everything is connected. And that can go for a woodland that's quite mixed, I think, as well or they're not perhaps quite as effective as I understand it. You've got lots of different speeches, perhaps not quite as good a, a connectivity with warnings in particular. And, and I think for, for the weather too, if drought stress, plants have got a great ability to, to, to sense what might be coming around the corner and just warning each other, right, get your reserves of water now. You know, really be careful about the months ahead. It's so clever, but it's quite a new thing. P people are, are learning. It's quite a new thing that people are studying. Uh, ben and even the simplest of things like in spring in particular putting your ear i mean within madagascar me and me and mum did this to baobabs i'm digressing here but this was an amazing experience putting your ear to the trunk of a baobab and just have that silence around you no one talking no insects chattering or birds and hear the water being osmotically drawn up the trunk mm. It is wow. the most over. You can hear mostly during the rainy season, which we were in. I must admit, not so much in the dry season. That energy of how ninety, hundred feet up the tree, it can pull water to the leaf tips, uh, it, and then transpire and release the moisture through the leaf via photosynthesis. It's an extraordinary thing, and yeah. I think we're learning so much more about the, these trees now and plants in general, how they equip themselves. Now uh, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Do you think they could be way more incredible than we even pause to, to think for the moment? Do you think they can think? Do you think potentially they have some kind of consciousness, maybe obviously different to ours, but do you think there's something potentially like that that could happen with plants? I think there is. I mean, the old story, I think it was Prince Charles who made it quite famous about talking to his tomato plants. <laughs> and the more he taught certain music that he played towards them, the more that they would grow and respond to it. And people laughed it off. But they are saying now that tomato plants are one of the most intelligent plants on the planet. And they really have an ability to respond. I think the conscious is quite a word to use, isn't it? But they certainly yeah. can respond to vibrations in the air certain good music i mean i do occasionally play music to my plants i must confess it was gangster rap last week and they didn't like puff daddy and p diddy and all those people oh, <laughs> that's a shame Pavarotti, they hated Pavarotti. <laughs> almost blew blew their leaves off but, but i think tomato plants are supposed to be quite intelligent and i get a bit skeptical sometimes about it the way it's worded and sort of bigged up in some of these articles you read i just for me ben rather than for me it's the sense you get when you're growing these plants uh, obviously they're alive in a plant sense but to me there is something more of a spiritual connection there is something there yeah. they're not going to talk to you they're not going to perhaps they might grow a certain way they only grow a certain way and well if you're feeding them well or looking after them is my argument really rather than a response to you talking to them nicely or it's how you're looking after them uh, that makes them really grow well and the conditions the environments they're in really however i do feel there is a connection and that's part of it for me there is a there is something there and being in a greenhouse like I was this morning, watering the orchid house. This time of the year, the temperatures are building quite nicely. Lots of humidity that you're creating by damping down the floor with the hose and, and watering the plants. There is a connection. They're springing to life and you're nurturing them to the best, to, to look the best that they can. And, but um, yeah, I'm sort of halfway house with certain elements of that. But yeah. I think tomato plants, there has been proven electrical movement, stimulation, in a tomato plant in response wow. to music and being spoken to nice rather than shouted at rather than being I mean, nice to a plant you are getting 
there was, was it like an electrical current sort of system mm. through the plant was increased by being nice to them and and they've wow. proven that to, to to a degree but um, yeah it's a fascinating subject and we only just started this it's mm. really going to delve every day that goes past it's on the news about the real real inside of a plant what well, what is it like how does it work we're pretty good at that but it's far more than that yeah it's fascinating it's absolutely fascinating it is because like you said they're alive and and at the end of the day there's lots we don't know and i would hazard a guess to say there's lots we don't know maybe about all the inner operatings of how yeah how they warn you know other plants of certain things or how they can communicate and and think in a way but yeah that's unknowns but it's fun to it's fun to talk about and think about um you must have heard of or come across this sandbox tree uh, or i don't know the actual name is it hura creptians or something it's the exploding fruit that it, it fires off it at insane speeds um have you come across that, you I heard of that that's all? really bad i haven't i should have shouldn't i what we've got <laughs> I haven't, what I love, it's a way of seed dispersing, isn't it, obviously? But I, I, I should know that. I'll Google it afterwards. That's terrible. You should, because it's an interesting one. I, I found out while I was just trying to research a while ago for this conversation. It's a, tro- a, tro- a tropical think, tree, right, of some yeah, sort? Yeah, yeah. Like and it's like covered in spikes, box. covered in spikes. Um, look, like they, look, they look terrifying, you know, and, and I think... What's the um, Latin, Latin name for it again? What is uh, it? I, I think it's Hura, so H-U-R-A, and then C-R-E-P-I-T-A-N-S. Oh, I don't I know. Exactly. I'm not going to try and pronounce it very well, but the sandbox tree, um, exploding fruit, and yeah, it sends these these spikes. I think they fly off this tree at a certain. I don't know why or or at what at what moment, but they fly off this fruit, and I think they they travel quite far, and they can actually like cause a lot of damage or or kill people. I think. Uh, um but yeah wild, it's, a wild seed, it's, a, it's a seed dispersal technique right presumably i, I believe so I'm, I'm pretty sure yeah it must yeah, be because sure. sure here be. we've got not as, as dramatic as that something called the squirting cucumber <laughs> it, it, it's amazing thing it's from mount pelion in greece if i've said that right and it's an amazing thing when it gets ripe it's related to a squash when it gets ripe it's got this amazing mechanism you touch it and the whole thing i mean seed gets dispersed at least 15 20 feet and if it hit, hits you blank range i mean it gets you in the eye it really hurts and it's yeah. a very cle- clever way of ensuring that the seed is as far away from the parent as possible in an area that's not out competing um and it's a very very clever way of doing it. i love doing that kids love that sort of stuff but yeah sandbox i'll have to look that tree up no yeah. I, in my ignorance that's terrible no, I, I don't, don't think the that. kids would like that one though. Well, they would as long as it's behind a big glass thing, probably. Yeah, there might be bit, bits of thorns <laughs> in their heads and blood every. No, we don't want that. <laughs> no, probably not. Have you ever heard of? Um, I think it's Pando. It's this colony of trees. Again, I found about it when I was when I was trying to find some interesting things. Pando, um, you caught me yeah, out again. No, Pando, Pando, uh, like a panda but with an O instead of an A. But it's a colony. I think there's forty three thousand identical trees, um, like basically like clones. They're all they've lived in this one area for I think it's between estimates range between a few hundred thousand years and a million years. And where, and where is um, it then? Where is I it? I think it's in North America. <laughs> In, I think it's Utah. I think it's Utah. I'm going off a couple of scribbled notes I had there about it. I, I, pre- I wrote down Utah. Um, but yeah, I think they're all interconnected via the roots under the ground. Um, and so they've been there for yeah this enormous amount of time. Basically, it's it's also oh. known as, I think, the oldest living organism on, on the planet because it's, it's one living organism. When new trees come, it's just still the same tree in a way that is amazing and i've heard of the cre- the creosote bush that that that's that, that's a 10 15 000 year, years old that's further south that's Cal- california i think that's a larea that's got a yeah that's pretty good yeah but no you should check this one out as well it just sounded crazy like the, the biggest living organism the oldest living organism forty three thousand basically clone trees um all together and and people say that it's like immortal in a way because no matter what happens, the the kind of the heart of this tree or this group of trees wow. is so deep down in the soil that it basically can be, it's just going to be fine. It's going to survive fire. It's going to survive some natural disaster. Um, and so even if you wipe out the 43,000 above ground, like this this colony or whatever, it's going to carry on. Um, wow. Yeah. Okay. Right. I'll have to investigate that. You can, don't catch me out again, please. Like twice now. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, no, the next one I'm interested in is I know you know about this. It's just oh, giant redwoods because you've. Yes, I know you know about I these. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know the redwoods. Yes. Um, it's just a tree that I've always wanted to see. I'd love to see a giant redwood up close. Like, what was that like? That experience being up against these massive trees and and how big can they grow and how old can they live and that kind of thing they're incredible well there are two varieties it can be quite confusing the world's single largest living organism Mm. one individual tree for its size is the the sequoia dendrum giganteum which is the giant sequoia now that's not the coastal one which is sequoia sempervirens that's on the pacific coast that's the tallest tree currently in the world the sequoia sempervirens that's 113 meters tall so the sequoia dendrons wow. which are mostly found in and around the yosemite national park both in, in california um they just are the giant and the general sherman tree uh, is, is, is a giant sequoia that's the single largest living organism and they get about what did they get two and a half three thousand tops years of age a good sort of 90 plus sort of meters tall, but there's 20 or 30 adults holding hands in a daisy chain can just about get around the tree, the base of the tree. It is an absolute wow. colossus. 20, and so on, oh, absolutely huge. Uh, yeah. they absolutely huge things. It, uh, to answer your first bit of the question, I mean, it's not, I don't find it a horticultural botanical experience. To me, that is a spiritual experience. I mean, it's, uh, it's just extraordinary going through these trees. You are on a different planet. You yeah. feel like you've been sort of transported somewhere else. The eerie silence, uh, inclu- including the, um, not not just humans and traffic and, and so on, because you're quite remote there anyway, but, 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 but the wildlife, everything seems just to be dulled the noise by these massive coniferous crowns i mean it is an extraordinary place i found it more overwhelming which most people did disagree with than its cousin on, on, on the pacific and that's the coastal redwood because some people the mist coming off the pacific and the mm. sword ferns all on the the forest floor with these amazing trees did that does give an atmosphere whereas yosemite is further inland much hotter you don't really get much um, as mist as you're not quite close to the as close to the uh, pacific coast but to me it was their sheer size and their dominance within a small area there's nothing else around it and their vulnerability so if it gets too hot if the they can take forest far they have bark that's a three foot thick bed and fire retardant too. So they can take fire. They're designed to take fire, but the intensity and, and the frequ- frequency. Frequency. The intensity <laughs> and the frequency. Frequency, that's an amazing word. <laughs> that's nice. That's, that's nice, but it's made up then. So the intensity and the frequency, <laughs> there we go, of the fires mean that they are struggling. The fires are getting into this bark time and time again, which they weren't as used to in the past because it's generally drier and hotter and climate change or whatever your take is on on that and cycles and, and so on and they really do struggle now a lot of the trees and people walking people don't realize and they've got these uh, high raised um, um boardwalks around the trees now to take the compaction off the roots of people's feet you don't think when you're there how can one person make a difference but when you've got millions of people visiting the compaction can really make the roots struggle and die off and the introduction of root rot diseases like phytophthora and things like that that can come on your shoe and stuff. So, so they're very vulnerable, and yet they're such an aristocratic giant of the, the tree world. Well, they are the top of their tree, <laughs> mm. <laughs> literally. Yeah, it's an amazing experience. The redwoods are fantastic trees. Wow. Yeah. I mean, anything that big that can live for that long. I mean, I would love to, I'd love to go and see them like in person. I'd love to go and, yeah. It's, they just sound amazing um, you'd love it you'd you absolutely love it and it, it blasted away absolutely blasted away we've Fantastic. got none in the uk have we we've got none no, no giant redwoods have we in the UK? not native but yet growing absolutely they love our condition there's one there's 110 foot one right outside the, the gatehouse here the great granny planted in 1890 oh, wow. sequoia dendron they do better in eastern seaboard england generally or eastern seaboard uk where it's a yeah. bit dry and generally warmer than the west coast where you likely more likely to see devon cornwall parts of wales 
Western Scotland, you're more likely to see the coastal redwood because it likes more moisture, like in the wild. And the mm. soil's not quite as good here. Although we do grow the coastal redwood, but it doesn't grow very tall here. But you still get that lovely orangey bark that they're both they're both blessed with. Uh, yeah. Fantastic trees. Yeah, they do very well in the UK. Often they're huge, huge plantings. You get them as avenues often in stately homes if the storms oh, wow, of yeah. the last few years haven't blown them over and they're a very dominant tree. Very, Amazing. yeah, striking. Amazing. Look, I, I feel like uh, we, we're kind of, we're burning time. I've almost got to let you go in a minute. I think we're nearly there, back we? Yeah. The, I need to let you get back to the plants. Um, oh, so yes, one of the, yes. <laughs> kind of the last, maybe penultimate or maybe the last question I'll ask you is, um, and you kind of mentioned climate change a second ago, which kind of leads into this um this question which is in the animal kingdom like with wildlife we're suffering major species loss um at the moment like worse than it's worse than it's been you know as far back as we can look mm. um and and i wanted to find out like at least from from what you know is it the same in the world of plants like are we suffering species loss with plants are we suffering loss of diversity biodiversity or what's the kind of the situation there? Because uh, you don't hear a lot about it necessarily. You hear about, you know, deforestation. You hear about losing species of wildlife. But we don't really hear about, yeah, just the, the plants. There, there is a lot. Yeah, it's usually the animals first, isn't it? But but yeah, yes, there are. Ben. And what's amazing, it's the globalisation, the globalised world that we are now, but basically. Mm. And the ability now with all the transport links that we've got of pests and diseases to, to spread to continents very easy in countries. And there's huge problems with um, pine forests in, in Canada being wiped out by beetles. Um, and also our, our desire to plant monoculture, so the monocrop, so mm. one variety of exactly often genetic the same variety of pine palm without oil as well. palm oil is another example of that but 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 i think yes in the sense of that's quite resilient to diseases and the palm oil is quite resilient however when you've got a beetle that loves a certain type of pine and all that you're planting especially in canada are these varieties of pines and sick and spruces and so on then the beetle's having a field day it's got there via however it's got there from all over the world the uk we're really suffering at the moment and whether it's um, drier climates, especially the last few years, there's a, a climate change. I do believe it. I'm very halfway house climate change and cyclic behavior. I, I think we definitely we're always cyclic. The world is a cyclic weather system that the cycles that we go in. But humans are definitely accentuating it. We're definitely mm. getting the extremities. There's no doubt. Ben. And that leads to things getting stressed. So beech trees are a great example. And they have a very, very shallow, well-known shallow root system. They're the first trees to be susceptible to dry conditions. We're losing quite a few around here because of the dry conditions. But as far as pests and diseases, my goodness me, we've never had so many introduced into the UK in the last few years and also into parts of uh, other parts of Europe. Ash dieback is a classic uh, airborne disease that's really attacking our, our ash trees. Sudden oak death, uh, phytophthora. So there are things because of the globalised world that we are in that are getting mm. to parts of the world that they never would have got to before until now. And it's the way that it's, it, it, there's no natural predators for these pests and diseases. There are in their natural environs, in their native areas, but not where they're coming to. There are no barriers and they just go through whole collections of trees and shrubs. So I think a combination of the global warming and indeed climate change, I do believe, and also the globalisation has led to plants being really under threat, let alone human activities in deforestation you mentioned. I mean, that's almost... I just almost in the background all the time you sort of you yeah. don't forget about it but so we are really challenging the plants and when plants are becoming extinct before they're even being discovered Ben mm. I mean there are species that aren't even being named in the rainforest in particular they're clearing a path for, for, for forestry vehicles when you lost two or three species that could cure for whatever disease a human might have that it could yeah. cure without even knowing what the plant is I think for me what I've really learned here with all of the aspects we're talking about now in the last few minutes, is it's so key to have a good, diverse collection of plants. I'm not being unpatriotic, but people have got to start moving away from some of our natives. I mean, it, but I'm not being unpatriotic, and I'll be in trouble for saying it, but it, it, it's a fact. Because of the variety of plants we've got here in the World Garden and elsewhere here at Lullingston and in the area, natives, yes, 
but often selected forms of natives or exotic plants from around the world, you have a much better chance of having a good collection. That the diversity is the key to keeping a good range of plants that won't be susceptible to all these pests and diseases. You'll get the odd tree, of course, that will be susceptible. But if you've got a good, diverse collection, the bugs and diseases aren't going to like everything in your collection. They're only going to go for certain plants. And having a good genetic diversity, a good base of plants is really, really important. And planting all the native trees in areas as street trees. And it's, it's got mad recently in the UK. It really has, because you'll often only be given a grant from the council or whoever to plant these native plants, but they're simply not suitable anymore for those conditions. Some of the exotic stuff is actually better off. Not always, but for, for, for the majority of the reasons. But yeah, that, having a diverse collection of alpines, herbaceous plants, other perennials and woody plants is the key to surviving and getting through global warming, climate change, increasing pests and diseases, because you've got your fantastic diversity there, which is a great antidote for all of these different things coming in. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. And I suppose as well, in the same sense as the wildlife, if we lose a specific species of plant or tree or flower, that's going to have impact on other plants, trees and flowers and, and insects and in turn then other plants. So it's always that cascading effect of, you know, the domino effect. Um, yeah, so absolutely suppose, right. As yeah. any of them yeah, become endangered or critically endangered, then, yeah, it's just going to get worse and worse like a snowball. So, yeah, I guess absolutely. the diversity yeah. is a great thing. Um this has been awesome, Tom. Um, really awesome again. Uh, to, to, to close us out, do you want to leave any final thoughts? Again, it can be about anything. It could even be, you know, a sales pitch for the World Garden, why people should come and check it out. Um, whatever you want um, to say to, to, to close us out. <laughs> oh, yeah, but Ben, for me, on a final note, what else can I say except we are just so excited to be open again at Lullingston in 2022. And the biggest thing of all, I love plants, as you know, and it's obvious and a pa passion for them. But I would not be anywhere without sharing the wonderful world of plants with people and being open as we are to visitors at Lullingston and the World Garden is such a buzz. And I can't wait for this season to really get underway. Bring it on. <laughs> amazing and i'm sure people are going to love that seeing you in your natural environment uh jumping around like a like a kid at christmas um yeah that would be quite the sight so i'll put information regarding uh the world garden and, That'd be and great. everything you do in the description so anybody that wants to go and check it out have a scroll down and all the information will be there so thank you Brilliant. so much again tom ben, thank you for the pleasure absolute pleasure last sorry about the phone calls now sorry about the phone <laughs> no, and a no, ton no. of coal i do apologize no, don't worry at all. Last conversation was amazing. This conversation was amazing. So much, uh, you know, so many experiences, so much interesting knowledge you've shared. Just unbelievable. Thank you so much. Uh, and Absolute if anybody pleasure. didn't watch the first one, if anybody hasn't seen the first one where, where Tom talks about his kidnap experience and, and hostage experience in, in the, pan, the the jungle in the Darien Gap between Panama and Colombia, you have to check out that episode. Um, it's unbelievable. Uh, but yeah thanks so much Tom this has Absolute been amazing absolute pleasure Ben good man and keep going with everything thank you so much I wish you all the best for the garden and, and everything else thanks a lot Ben brilliant cheers Tom cheers Ben thanks a lot thank you for listening to that conversation with the one and only Tom Hart Dyke I hope you enjoyed it if you haven't watched part one with Tom it's an absolute must and the link is in the description please check out Tom's links in the description to find out more about him and to get more info about his world garden why not check out the rest of ours while you're there Thanks for listening to Have You Met. Be nice, be happy, be cool.